Welcome to the Know It Some podcast, bringing you the widest variety of conversational interviews for a well-rounded perspective on life. Because while it's true, nobody likes a know-it-all, it's also good to know it some. Here's your host, Steve Platt. That's right. I'm Steve Platt, and you're listening to the Know It Some podcast, an affiliate of the Big Three Roll-Up Network. Welcome back to all of our weekly listeners, and a big thank you for supporting the show as subscribers. Please continue to tell your friends. I really love hearing from new listeners who were referred to the show. I I read and respond to all the messages that come in, and it's been so wonderful to get all the positive feedback. Again, thank you. And if you're a first-time listener, thanks for joining us. Be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode. Go ahead and do that now before you forget. And if you like the show, please do us a favor and give us that five-star ranking on Apple or iTunes because doing so helps us continue to bring on interesting guests each and every week, and it really is the best way to support the show. Another way to support the podcast is to follow us on social media. You can find us at KnowItSomePod. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, etc. That's KnowItSomePod on all social media platforms. Okay, this week's guest is a man of many talents. He's an actor and martial artist. He's from Chicago. You might recognize his work from doing commentary for mixed martial arts across multiple organizations or as the host of the hit show Human Weapon, formerly on the History Channel. Jason Chambers is an incredibly interesting guy who shared with us some great stories. And, you know, he was a tremendously gracious guest. His latest film... Ask Me to Dance, just wrapped up shooting, and is currently in post-production, so follow him on social media for that release date. Please welcome my friend, Jason Chambers. Hey Jason, welcome to the Know It's On Podcast. Good to be here, finally. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we, we had some hiccups, but I'm glad that we were able to make this work. I appreciate it greatly. Um, you know, how, how's the family doing? Good? Family's doing good. Um, you were This was like third time the charm. I, first time uh, <laughs> we were supposed to do this, I broke my pinky. Second time the wife got ill, I had to take her to the hospital. And today I went to the gym and I swear to God, I almost <laughs> didn't go because I was just like, it's my first time going back to a gym in probably about three and a half weeks right Um, just the first week just missing it because of being uh just life happening and in the last couple weeks because of the pinky and i was like damn do i go i'm almost (laughs) sure if i go i'm gonna break a toe or something i'm gonna get in a car wreck on the way there uh, so (laughs) it was a it was a big win leaving today stretch a little extra before you you hit the the workout kind of warm up a little extra than than you would normally um yeah yeah, i'm not I'm not trying to develop that reputation for, for having a, a bad omen for, for my guests, but I, I think that might be a thing at this point. Um, yeah, this, <laughs> this is like becoming the Conjuring series. Like every episode is a new frightening tale of how the guests got to be where they're at. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, so I want to ask you about this because I've, I've seen this about you online uh, uh, quite a bit, um, but I, I haven't seen it on video or anything uh people calling you hollywood so the nickname hollywood um you you didn't grow up in hollywood right i mean you you're you're from chicago area from chicago yes so how did you end up getting that nickname how did you end up in hollywood in entertainment um you know when did you know that you wanted to work as an actor and and in entertainment so um there's there's like three questions in there so how did i get the nickname (laughs) How did I get the nickname Hollywood? So the nickname Hollywood, I guess it kind of parallels into how I got involved in the uh, entertainment space. So I've always had kind of two passions when I was growing up. One of them was uh, martial arts, because um, like many people, uh, I was like picked on and bullied by a couple of kids in grammar school. So I got into a martial arts program and um, just really gravitated towards that. And the, the classes were uh Jeet Kune Do classes. This was back in like 1994, 1995. And the class structure was an hour and a half long. And the first like 30 minutes was kickboxing. The next 30 minutes was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with a gi. And then the last like 20, 25, 30 minutes was trappings of JKD stuff, kind of the wing chunk. So those were really the first evolution of mixed martial arts. Okay. Backing up for a second. Aside from that, I went to an all boys Catholic high school 
Yeah, so and really, I, so, okay. yeah, so like the only way to, to, to meet girls was to do intramural sports, and that wasn't my cup of tea. And then the other option was to do theater at the girls' schools. So I would right. go and I would like audition to do like theater at the girls' schools. And one of the schools actually had this insane auditorium, uh, Maria High School in Chicago, which ironically not only now is a, is a public school, but it was a, it was the high school my mom went to back when Jesus Christ was uh, also <laughs> a classmate. And uh. Right. When, when Burger King was a prince. So, mm -hmm. so I always, I always had these two kind of passions that I balanced, right? I had the martial arts side and then I had that theater side because like I was saying, you know, you had to go to a female school to be able to, 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 to meet any girls. Otherwise you had to do intramural sports. So those were always kind of like the two things I was balancing. So I would, um, you know, I was training and doing martial arts and I had an opportunity. I did some Brazilian jiu-jitsu matches back in the early 90s. And then like around 1997, 1998, these events called like Battle of the Masters were pretty popular. And they were doing them in Iowa. And these they even had some like underground MMA stuff where you'd go to these bars like Finkies in Indiana and you could just sign up to go fight. It was like open palm. It was the, the very early days of any and i i use the word structured mixed martial arts because sanctioned wouldn't be the right word it wasn't right. even sanctioned until a few years ago um these events so uh the guy that i was training with joe goitia in chicago was promoting one called i think at the time it was called the jeet kundo challenge it later got rebranded as the total fight challenge and it's where um like matt hughes one of the first ufc champions at a uh, walter White champions uh, had his first fight and a lot of people um, from the Midwest came up through those ranks, tons of UFC guys. So I had my first match there because I was like, oh, I can make a few bucks and do that. And, um, you know, so the way I got the nickname Hollywood was I was always doing silly, dumb shit. Like I'd dye my hair blue. Uh, I'd like, shave a mohawk and dye it yellow and stuff like that. And also probably I was tanning way too much. Like I was addicted <laughs> to tanning beds. Like I grew up in the NSYNC Backstreet Boys era and, uh, mm -hmm. You know, like I was in denial for a long time that I was the sixth member of, of NSYNC, but I think I probably was. I mean, I was going, my buddies and I would go like tanning and then we'd go out to like this club zero gravity in Chicago. It was horrible. But um, so anyways, long story short, uh, somebody was like, man, what do you think you're in Hollywood? You're always like, you're tanning, you're going, you're dying your hair. Like I was probably the only, only goofball that would go out to fight at 18 years old and have like fully done hair. Like, cause that matters, right? <laughs> like, like it's so important. You have pomade and hairspray. Like there's probably some poor guys that I fought back in the mid nineties in the Minnesota that had like Aquanet dripped into their faces mid match. So, <laughs> so um, that was just kind of, that was just kind of the balance. And, and um, it just kind of haphazardly became the nickname that uh, I guess I rolled with for a little while. And um, yeah, so that was that. And then I moved, it moved from, um, so actually there was, that was kind of the, the stepping stone. There was a, I, I believe there was a, a, an agency called Aria in Chicago. And one of the people that was fighting on the card, um, her, her like aunt or something was like the owner of this talent agency. And I had went in and met with her and she kind of steered me in the right direction because there's this, um, like, you know, in the United States, we don't have, we don't have uh, royalty, right? So celebrity kind of becomes our royalty and people kind of discount the, the ability that it takes to um, to really be successful in the entertainment career. You hear about all these like, oh, I was walking on the beach and this manager plucked me up and now I'm a Disney star and three weeks later I'm in, I'm in Transformers. Like, <laughs> but, but for every one of those outliers and those unicorns, there's 50,000 people that didn't get those opportunities. And it really is an amalgamation of having to be in the right place at the right time because I don't care – how great of an actor you are, um, you have to get lucky to book these roles. Right, because, right. You, I mean, so many times you walk into a casting, let, like take an episode of like CSI New York, right? Mm -hmm. Like they get, they get a breakdown for, you know, um, Frank the hot dog vendor and he's got 10 lines, right? Well, not only do you have to look like what the casting director thinks you should look like, but you have to really be incredibly lucky to book anything in the entertainment world because, you know, you can be like... It, if you go to school to be a doctor and you really persevere and you buckle down and you do great and you do well on your, on your MCATs and you do well in, in med school and you do well in your residency for a large part of your career, you have a tremendous amount of control over the trajectory of that. It's unlikely that you'd go to med school, do really well, graduate, you know, cum laude, uh, and then just not be able to find a job. Mm -hmm. That's like not the case when it comes to like the entertainment industry. You have to get lucky because, you know, first of all, if you take a hundred people, probably 75% of those people just don't take the business that serious and they never really 
go to a class, they don't study because there's no, unless you go to like Juilliard or you're getting a theater degree, which a lot of those theater degrees still don't even really teach you the business of acting. They give you like a lot of background and you're doing these stupid anthologies and monologues and it's just, it's really antiquated. So, um, you know, you have to get lucky. And uh, that's the that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand. So I, uh, I talked to the girl that ran Aria and she was like, you got to get in some classes. And because I was really like a nerd when it came to like the martial arts stuff. And, and like when you step into a cage to fight, you 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 get exposed immediately if you're not prepared. Anyone can say, hey, I'm going to fight next weekend at this event. But if you think you're a good fighter, you'll find out really well where your weaknesses are, because, um, you know, like, look, most people go through through their lives endeavoring to avoid confrontation but when you have a set date where someone's training peaking getting in shape to kick your ass like they're in great shape to do so and and should arguably be well-rounded in any of the myriad of different disciplines needed to accomplish that so um, you know you go in and 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 i kind of brought the mentality of my martial arts training over to the acting side where I was very focused and let, let me get these classes done and let me just make sure I can get in these things. And, um, and when from Chicago, I left and went to New York and uh, it lived in Brooklyn for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, submitting myself uh, for background work on like soaps or anything that was shooting out there. And, and uh, I had a few background working days as a, as an extra on, uh, I got off was as the world turns, I worked on a bunch of the soaps, but that led to my first, uh, it's called U5. We have under five lines, which is one of the, the after, at the time it was after, which was American Federation of Television Radio Artists and SAG were two separate unions, the uh, Screen Actors Guild. And okay. um, that was how I got my my after card was I finally got a couple lines on a, on a shitty little soap opera. Like, and of course, <laughs> like, like I did the typical thing, every like background person that has like five or th- three or four lines, like, like all they want you to do is bring the menu over and say, here's the menu. Let me know when you're ready to order. But like what happens is, is you feel like this is your Oscar moment. So you overact, <laughs> you overact the shit out of it. And it's like you over prepare so much for this stupid line and it's crazy. And, um, I, you know, so, uh, but I did that for a little bit and I was also bartending in New York while simultaneously training uh, at the Henzo Gracie's. And um, a funny story, I was, I was uh, bartending in, in Manhattan and I was just messing around with flair bartending, you know, where you flip the bottles around and you do some cool stuff to kind of keep yourself entertained. Yep. And um, I, I was working on a, a soap opera, which I don't know if anyone uh, that's, um, you know, like males in our demographic have ever really watched a soap, but for the most part, they're overly dramatized. Everything is life or death, super high stakes, and it's very serious. Yep. This is not a place where a bartender should be in the background flipping bottles. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I remember the first time I got yelled at on a set, uh, there's this really intense scene that's going on about 30, 20 feet in front of me, right? And I'm just in the background, just supposed to just be wiping down the, the bar or something, making fake drinks and setting them up or doing bar cleanup. And they're talking about how like, you know, they can't find the missing girl and the sister's now been cloned and the brother's banging the alien friend's neighbor's cousin. And I don't know, it's, all, it's craziness, right? But it's this intense scene. And then like in the background, I'm over there like throwing bottles up and spinning them on my head. And she, like, it looked like <laughs> it looked like horrible Cirque du Soleil. But it, it, long story short, uh, I was not working on that soap after that. Like, so <laughs> so um, yeah, so from there, I, uh, I went to Los Angeles. And this whole time, I kind of had that that mix of like, um, you know, training, but just really to like, I never wanted to be a professional fighter. Like my goal was never, man, this is a, a viable career path by any stretch of the imagination, because especially back in the early 2000s, um, it just wasn't financially feasible. I mean, there if there were 100 guys in the UFC, which was arguably the pinnacle of mixed martial arts, except for maybe pride at the time, there was only right. maybe one or two guys that were really making uh, deep six figures. I'd probably say that 20 of the top 100 guys in the UFC were making enough money to um, sustain themselves. And then, but sustain themselves, I don't mean living like a pauper, 30, 40, $50,000 a year. Like sustain themselves where, you know, hey, look, you could take a week off. You know, they're making six figures because right. the, first, the first UFC contracts, I mean, like here, I had, I finally got to a place where I was uh, offered a contract to fight in the UFC. And it was supposed to be against Spencer Fisher. And it was on the UFC 60 card, which I think was just the 15 year anniversary recently. It was like in May, it was Hoist Gracie fought Matt Hughes. It was a big, big card. And um, like the way the fights work is you get 
pay and show or you get a show and win money so if you go in to fight you're guaranteed x number of dollars and then if you win that fight whether it's through submission tko judges decision you're declared the winner you get an additional amount and, and it's typically a double so if you were getting fifty thousand to show if you won you got another 50 grand the problem was back then and this was like UFC 60, right? Like 60 pay-per-views in Matt uh, Hughes, Hoist Gracie, big card at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Well, like you're fighting the toughest guys in the world. And I remember the first contract, and this was across the board. It really didn't matter who you were unless you came as a superstar from somewhere else. But the first contract was two and two, um, four and four, six and six. So it's like two and two. You could train for eight weeks get an M you got to pay for your own MRI. You got to pay for your own physicals, your blood work. You, you typically flew in an additional corner, man. You had to put them up. You had to pay for all your supplements, your training camps. And you could go fight in the UFC and even win your first match and come out upside down, which the economics of that to me was just crazy. So, um, you know, so I was supposed to watch, fight Spencer Fisher in the meantime, I had done the pilot for human weapon, which uh, I found haphazardly, uh, on my own. I had representation in Los Angeles and I was doing a little bit of this stuff, but I found, uh, I found this audition on, on this forum called the MMA underground forum, which was sub fighter before that. And, uh, auditioned for it, didn't think anything of it, ended up booking it. And they're like, Hey, this is a, we're going to do a pilot. So we went out, we went to Thailand. We shot the pilot for like 10 days. They really didn't know. They had a general idea of what the show was going to be. They weren't super specific on you know, what would the episode actually look like? So because of that, they have to shoot an exorbitant amount of footage so that the network has a lot of different opportunities. If they go back and say, man, we really love this aspect. Let's see more of that, less of the fighting, more of the culture stuff. So we, we filmed that and we didn't hear anything for several months. I mean, we heard a couple, every couple of months we'd hear, oh, you know, from the production company, it's looking good. They really like it. It's looking good. Uh, it's looking good. A um, couple little changes. Um, but, you know, for the most part, pilots and not to be redundant, if, if your audience is listening to this, or you know, but they'll make like the television industry hasn't figured out a, a better way to to streamline this process. So they'll make 50 pilots. They'll shoot an episode. They'll cast it. Everyone on it. It's just as if you're on the, the 90th episode of Seinfeld. Everyone's got their paychecks. It's a big production. And then, um, and then they just take that one episode and then they test it. The audience, te they, they do focus groups. They go, well, do you like it? Do you not? And out of like 50, maybe like one, two, three will get picked up into series. So it feels like when you book a pilot, uh, oh man, this is it. This is my big break. And it can be a big break. But for the most part, you know, 95% of those just fall by the wayside. So, and this was just some History Channel show that, you know, this does not have the budget of an NBC network series. Like, you know, we were making peanuts. Uh, everyone figures if you're on TV, you must be rocking Ferraris and now you're living in mansions <laughs> and stuff, which just isn't the case, at least in the very beginning. So we didn't hear anything. And I got this contract for the UFC and um and joe rogan was a good friend of mine and uh we at the time we uh were training at 10th planet and i remember i got the contract and i was like well this is cool this would be a cool opportunity at least i can get a little get my name out there a little bit make a few bucks because i was living in la and uh you know i was super broke and um you know the the show got picked up and i remember asking joe like man what do i do because joe and eddie bravo were definitely a large part of the reason that I had the opportunity in the UFC because they had Joe Silva, the former UFC matchmakers ear a lot. And that was coupled with things like, I don't want to name names, but a couple of UFC vets had come in to train and did, did jujitsu at Eddie's and uh, I submitted them. And Joe was like a big jujitsu nerd. He was like, Oh shit, you know, Chambers is <laughs> tough and he's, he's really good at jujitsu and this and that, but you know, jujitsu is not fighting. And I mean, I, I, I had arguably decent high school wrestling and, decent mediocre hands um my my big attributes were just that i was just tough you know i just i got my butt kicked for so long under the worst circumstances ever that like getting in, in a cage like i'd stand toe to toe with anybody they really didn't care uh, and, and oftentimes came out on the losing side of that decision but um you know so i had that opportunity and i was like man joe what do i do and he's like man if you don't have to fight don't fight and i remember thinking about that and just going you know what man that's that's uh that's that's great that's a good good advice because like i was saying i mean at that time, the money was so shitty. You'd watch the UFCs and they'd have a guy getting ready to go into the cage and, and Goldie at the time, uh, you know, Goldberg and, um, and Mike Goldberg and Joe Rogan, they'd be talking and they'd be like, oh, this is a, you know, um, uh, Frank Mir, he's a, he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He's also a construction worker hailing out of Idaho. And it's like <laughs> you had to have you had to have a job to support to support this right. crazy passion. It was insane. So, um, 
you know, uh, and, and really the big tipping point for the UFC was the Ultimate Fighter show, which really kind of helped push that more mainstream and in stuff. And uh, and even now, like people go to the UFC, and I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think the base pay is like fourteen and fourteen. So if you finally get to that level where you're like, all right, I'm gonna get in there, you can, and, and you're gonna get some money from Reebok. You know, you can fight and you win in your first fight. You're still gonna walk away with thirty, thirty five, forty grand for your first fight, which is, which is, uh, it, it makes it more viable as a career path. Now, if the money was better like that when I started. You know, who knows? Maybe I would have been more dedicated and more committed to it. But, um, you know, I really was uh, I, w- I had no illusions of of um, being a UFC champion. I feel very much like I would have been that gatekeeper, win two, lose two, win one, lose one, get right. cut. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> but but so so at that time, right, you, you, you had shot the pilot. It looked like you were going to be on that UFC 60 card. I'm guessing that one of the big decisions to not take that fight was that the pilot got picked up. So, so what was the initial order for human weapon? Did it get picked up for a full season or were they like, Hey, we'll let you do, you know, X number of episodes. How did that look at uh, when, when you got the call that, Hey, you know, we're, we're actually going to make this show. Yeah. So that was a, that was a, a cool moment. Um, I, you know, they, they called us and they were like, Hey, we want you guys and, and you guys, meaning me and Bill Duff to come to Knoxville, Tennessee, which is where, uh, Jupiter Entertainment, the production company, was based out of it, and, I, and we we all but knew that the reason we we're going there was because it was getting picked up, and they they picked it up for, gosh, I want to think it was a full season. I don't know if that was ten or twelve. I mean, we did a total of, I think it was twenty episodes. Some of those were like they re-sliced and diced a couple of them just to kind of put it together. So they they picked it up, and, they, and then it was like go go go. So the way that we we shot that was we'd we'd fly somewhere and then we'd be gone for three weeks. So we'd fly like theoretically to France and then we'd go from France to Greece, then from Greece to Israel, and then we'd go back home. Uh, and then we'd do all that. Yeah, we'd shoot it. So and, and you know, and it's it's a very like surreal feeling. I remember the first like when we were shooting it at first you know, and we started getting more comfortable as like what, what, what the show was and stuff. You know, there were certain changes that got made along the way because Bill Duff, who I'm still good friends with to this day. I love the guy like a brother. Um, You know, like there's, he's, I mean, I was six feet, um, you know, 175 pounds at the time. Bill's six, four, 280. And, (laughs) you know, when we go to, we went to Southeast Asia for the first few episodes and the way the show was supposed to work was they were going to have the, the grand master was going to pick which one of us fought their champion at the end of the episode. Well, <laughs> like, like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a giant to the average Filipino bill. isn't an option to most people generally. So like, right, so right, for the yeah, first yeah. like three or four shows, they kept picking me and I'm like back to back just getting my ass kicked. And I'm like, we need to mix this up a little bit, man. Like well, this, <laughs> this show is going to be sponsored by ibuprofen. If this is what keeps up. So you're fighting somebody that's trained in a discipline for their whole life. And you, you've been shown this discipline for, you know, what a few hours a day. Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, it was so, yeah. So like what, what the history channel would say, right. Is that we're there, um, it, you know, exploring the history, the culture, the martial arts, which was very much the truth. The, the, the downside is, is, you know, like some of these locations are like in the middle of a jungle. So they're remote. It takes us two hours to drive to these sometimes, right? At five or six in the morning and then we're stuck in traffic. So we don't have the luxury where, where we would tell people and then we jogged for seven miles up the hill. <laughs> like, no, what, what really happened was we ran past camera for four minutes, six times, like just because we just can't do that you know and that's everyone was like you must have been in the best shape of your life being on that show i'm like that's like saying i did the movie gi jane and i must now be like a sniper no like i mean there's some things i'm slightly more proficient at because i was incrementally exposed to them but by no means was i able to train i mean we would train you know, maybe an hour, but like a lot of the training was broken up because at the end of the day, right, we're making a TV show. We're not there so that Jason and Bill can have these wonderful, enriching cultural life experiences. We're there to, you know, show people and highlight the show. And then at the end of it, uh, you know, the, the problem that I had, there was two things that I would have changed had I been the producer of the show is I wouldn't have built these end fights and they have to build towards something. So I got that, but the balance was always, we had to make these, these, these fights at the end realistic enough that people would stick around to hopefully want to see us get our butts kicked or get their butts kicked or how are they going to do in this, but also not so devastating that 
th- literally the next day we had to fly somewhere else and start taping the next day again. So we couldn't have downtime. We couldn't, we couldn't risk. Okay. Well, I got a black eye. Now the next episode, I got to have a black eye, you know, like there's that you, we couldn't do that. So that, that, that was always a very difficult balance. And especially when there was language barriers um, between kind of figuring out how do we dial in these fights enough where there's sparring exhibitions. And I think that really, like, if I were to change one thing, they should have had us go against novices in their own divisions because then that shows hey you you guys you guys trained here for a week and there are certain attributes right like i mean when i did ju- the judo episode you know i've done judo a little bit i, I have a black belt in jiu-jitsu you know would i have mopped the floor with a white belt in judo probably so that probably wouldn't have made sense but when they give you a four-time world judoka champion there's nothing competitive about this match <laughs> like, right right know, yeah. it's it's here's 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 the white guy getting frequent flyer miles getting thrown through the air so which is fine um, so that was the one issue that we had with, I had with that. And the other thing was, you know, I think that the show, it was a dichotomy because on one hand it opened my eyes to, um, you know, as a mixed martial artist, I got a little cocky with, Oh, I know what works and what doesn't work. And to some degree, I do stand by that, that like, if someone said, should I go train karate? My first question would be like, well, why do you want to train martial arts? And if self-defense is your answer, I don't really think karate is the best answer. <laughs> um, you know, but on the same token, if you're, you know, if you, I, I, I did not have a tremendous amount of respect for Krav Maga until I went to Israel and saw real Krav Maga and the mindset behind that and, and stuff like that. So um, one of the things was that it really opened my eyes to uh, not just thinking like, hey, this the jujitsu was the end all because even within the parameters of what we're doing as mixed martial artists, that's still a very defined set of circumstances. There's rounds, there's a time limit. You don't have to worry about like protecting someone else. Your back is never to a wall where there's another wall to your left. You don't have to worry about getting hit with a beer bottle. So, um, you know, the question I used to get a lot is, what's the best martial arts? Uh, and my answer was, well, why do you want to train? because uh, it's like what's what's the best movie well do you want to do you enjoy being scared do you want to learn something i mean it really depends on on right. and what's the end game right so i mean i think that's one of the things that was that was interesting but yeah you like i said we'd go there we'd, we'd train for five days because we had to have a bookend of flying in and out usually so four to five days was our typical training sequences and then at the end we would uh you know we would air quote fight someone else yeah well you know we we would watch that show when we were deployed in Afghanistan. We would watch. We had all the episodes on uh, hard drive, and in our downtime, we we'd put on Human Weapon in the tent. All all the Marines would gather around, watch, and then we got a kick out of the fact that you guys did a, a McMap episode, a Marine Corps martial arts program, um, of which I'm a black belt. But we kind of consider it a a a Mickey Mouse kind of like like ridiculous martial art because it's not really a true one. And it only really makes sense if you're wearing full, you know, battle gear. And so even the guys that were like really into McMap, they they got out, away from that. They got into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They got more into grappling and, you know, learning how to, to do kimuras and arm bars and, and that kind of thing. And away from the, the Marine Corps martial arts program. But you guys did an amazing job of, of humoring us uh, with that episode and, and, and treating us as if we were you know, among Krav Maga and Jiu Jitsu and all that. So I, I appreciate the kindness there. Um, but, but I'm surprised you guys didn't do a Jiu Jitsu episode considering your background. Um, I, you know, you're a, a Gracie, uh, black belt, correct? Yeah. My, I have a black belt from Henzo Gracie. Yeah. So I, you know, that would have been an incredible episode. And what I, what I learned later when I was looking for, you know, the second and third season of, of the show to, to pop up on, on these hard drives, is despite the incredible popularity, you know, most shows, they get canceled due to, to lack of interest. You guys were the number one, number two show on the entire network and, um, and, and the show ended. And so I'm guessing you guys probably had plans to do jujitsu and, and other martial arts and, and it just didn't pan out due to whatever issues with the production company. Yeah, that's, that's very accurate. So, um, to backtracking with there were certain elements that had to tick the boxes for the history channel one of the reasons and i was a huge advocate let's go to brazil let's go to brazil just selfishly because i wanted to go to brazil and, <laughs> uh, and um the reason they didn't do a jujitsu episode was they felt like that that there wasn't enough history and culture behind it yet because if you look at some of the martial arts like japan like karate or or you know taekwondo these have been around for a lot longer and there's a lot yeah. more history behind it and they also felt like ah this isn't necessarily 
you know, there's certain elements of like, you look at boxing, you look at um, Eskrima, these are very visually easy to follow, easy to understand. Hey, this guy's punching, that guy's kicking, he's winning, he's losing. Um, they were like, these guys are wearing Jedi outfits and they're kind of <laughs> like they're rolling with each other on the ground. And like arguably jujitsu's more you have you have to be a little bit more evolved and you have to really like the people that truly it's like watching chess versus watching you know uh, um uh, checkers right like it's absolutely you, know, you can appreciate it more the more uh, you know you understand it and um so that was one of the things that you know i was bummed we didn't do we did do a, a mixed martial arts episode which i was um you know i don't want to take all the credit for that but I, I it was my idea to to push that forward and um nice. you know uh, get that was the closest we got to some of the bjj aspects but um you know the up until the last episode we did which was the taekwondo episode um which I, out of all the episodes we did the taekwondo one was the one i was the most nervous about uh going into because uh, just because i've seen some vicious knockouts uh in mm. taekwondo and if you watch that episode bill gets knocked out by a 135 pound 60 year old korean who just hits him on the button and just face plants him and then that's the episode that i tore my acl in because i was doing things that were far or I was endeavoring to do things far above my pay grade. <clears throat> um, but yeah, even, a- yeah. So even after that, uh, like there was another show on history at the time called ice road truckers. And um, that was just good old fashioned, turn your brain off and watch people curse and get stuck. And, you know, the closer to death you could get the better. Um, you know, the, the thing with our show especially was up until human weapon history channel was really known as like the civil war documentary channel, right? It was the world war two and now in color. And it was really just kind of this, this antiquated show. So what they were trying to do, or this series, I should say, is they were trying to, to, to build a flagship show that wouldn't just be like part of their programming. They were like, let's find a new show that can totally rebrand the network into this like you know the history channel and the discovery channel always kind of had, were back and forth in terms of like they were the nbc to the cbs to the abc right like they were always kind of each other's uh, um uh, competitor so they they put a bunch of money behind advertising the show and it was really a cool experience the problem they had is that from the production company's point of view they were they they were like hey the history channel like they waited forever to say let's make this show and then they went all right, we love it. Let's go. Let's go now. Let's go fast. And this production company, the like, they hadn't done any really big things. They were they had done stuff for the History Channel. They had done some like like the show Snapped and some smaller stuff, but they weren't the the scale of this production to shoot all this brand new footage and be overseas and logistically come back and edit it and get all the graphics in. And you know, we don't feel we had all that that motion capture graphic stuff that yep. they had to shoot and fill in. And and I, here's a little inside tidbit: the the motion capture guy that would do all the motion capture was my old martial arts instructor Joe Guaitia. So I got him oh, plugged cool. into. Yeah, plugged into doing all that. So, um, so they did. You know, like you said, the every week it was probably seventy percent ice road truckers, and then there'd be a week or two that we'd be in the number one spot. And it is very rare that a network loses that. So my understanding, and uh, this this needs to be a sit down between the former president of the History Channel and and myself to figure this out. But what I was told, my understanding is that the um the way that the episodes would work is we'd we'd shoot these episodes, we'd have all this footage. Then they would make it, they'd send it back to Jupiter Entertainment and they'd make a rough cut. This is what we think the episode should look like. And they'd send that off to the History Channel executives. Then the executives would make their notes. Hey, let's have more of this, less of this. Let's get a little more of this and do this. Then they'd do a fine cut and then they'd say, okay, this is it. Well, the way they monetize, obviously, television shows is through ad revenue, through commercial space. And they do this thing called the upfronts um, where they, they talk about all the new shows and all the networks and all the buyers for the agencies go. And yeah, we love this work. All right, here's 300 grand for that. These 12, 30 second spots and all this money. And that's how they subsidize it. Well, obviously it goes without saying like new episodes are infinitely more attractive to viewers than here's a rerun. Oh, we saw that one already. So the problem that they would have is that the history channel would have their TV guide. I think that was actually a thing still uh, that would list <laughs> like next week on human weapon is going to be karate. Then the week after that's Krav Maga. The week after that's going to be the McMath episode. And then we'd have the karate episode and then they'd have some issues where they couldn't get the next episode out in time. So they had to show a rerun and that's, mm. 
death. That is death to a network. So they would show a rerun. They'd lose money. And then they'd have to change because not only did they show a rerun here, now they have this new episode and they got to figure out how do they put this in the future based on this lineup there. I mean, the production company is, you know, like a month or two out. The, the history channel is thinking three months out, six months out in terms of where they're going to have things kind of fall. So that became a huge issue where um, they were back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, to my knowledge, yeah, we're the only like number one or number two show that was ever canceled because even after the last episode, we had started before the last episode, um, you know, we had meetings about what do you guys want to do? Um, Bill and I had a little bit more of a voice in terms of episodes we wanted to see. Boxing was on there. We had some um, some crazy you some some crazy wrestling that was on there but not like regular american wrestling it was like some uh, some malaysian form of wrestling we had a uh, uh, jiu brazilian jiu-jitsu was on there we had a bunch of stuff and then we, we even talked about going back to the mcmap thing what do we do if we run out of actual martial arts because you know there's a, there's a, a number of martial arts but it's a finite number at some point you go what's next and what we talked about was going into more of the the military stuff what's the special forces do here what are the what's the kind of rebranding how the mcmap program works for different stuff so we had a bunch of episodes i think they had about 15 to 20 the history channel wanted to see on paper and um you know at the end of the first well i guess first second season we basically made two short seasons or one long season depending on how you looked at it but i think they actually made it two seasons mm -hmm. um they, they they were like hey for sure we're gonna go forward and then it was like probably gonna go forward most likely gonna go forward hold on for a second oh. okay we're not doing this um you know which was which was uh it was disheartening but at the time also i felt like um uh, you know, I had a lot of good that came from that. I mean, Hollywood's always looking for the next leading man, like, right. Like the next action yeah. guy. And for like a microsecond. And I mean, like a blink of the eye, I had a little bit of heat about like, Oh, this guy could be like an action star. He's a moderately good looking. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't stumble over himself when he talks. He's a martial arts guy and he's like in his mid twenties. So and you got I, better uh, hair than Jason Statham. So you got that going for you. Yeah. I mean, I had, I mean, any hair is probably better than Jason Statham, but, yeah. but, um, Jason Statham's uh, actually a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. He's a, uh, I, I have a couple of good stories about Statham, but anyways, yeah. So like, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a sexy bastard, isn't he? Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's uh so yeah. So like we did that. And then what happened was, you know, I, I was part of me was like, this sucks, but the other part of me, and this is the part of me that the Hollywood people are like meeting your agents, managers and stuff are kind of pumping into you is like, you know, it, it's okay. We, ideally we do the show another year or two, but then we want to take you away from this, this low budget history channel stuff. And it's time to do movies. Right. And that's, that's the end game for everybody is be the big Avengers action star. And um, so I started, I wasn't super bummed about it, not going anywhere. I, I was with this agency called Gersh and I went out on a couple of auditions and I booked like a guest star on like CSI New York and a, a recurring character on this ABC family middleman show. And then uh, the anomaly happened, which was the writer's strike in, in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And when the writer's strike happened, the, the, all the reunion writers stopped writing, which then stopped production, which stopped casting, which meant that there was just a handful of things that were still going on. And it's basically the trail down, the trickle down of what was happening. So you'd have these big movie stars that you'd only see in movies suddenly doing these recurring guest stars. You'd have these series all that was out there. Yeah, you'd have these series. Like, I remember being in rooms auditioning and there'd be like Ryan Reynolds in the room with me. And I'm like, well, I'm not booking this role. And I mean, you want to talk about just <laughs> turning in the shittiest audition ever because, you know, like for sure you're not bush booking this when there's like you're sitting in a room with eight people and you see everybody is like a, a huge tv star like you know mm -hmm. like and it's like you, you're just not you're, you're like on the come up this isn't gonna happen so so that that's um you know kind of put the kibosh on the entertainment industry uh for a bit and then um i started apex sports agency which was a uh, sports agency that managed mixed martial artists initially and we moved into we moved into uh, extreme sports and did contracts and sponsorships and stuff for that. And it started Very in 2011. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, with the Apex sports agency, were you managing folks that you had maybe trained with uh, fought with the folks that you knew um, at first and then growing from there? Yeah. So I think like, like most um, yes is the short answer. So I was kind of left with this, what do I do now scenario, like 2009 to 2010. And what I was left with was, all right, I don't want to fight anymore. Um, and I have relationships on both sides of the, the entertainment world. I have, uh, you know, athlete friends that I've met through 
either training, fighting, or, or being exposed to you through the show. And then I had relationships with, um, you know, people that were on in the that entertainment attorneys, production companies, stuff like that, that I had met either through being set up through my age, my agent or managers. So I saw an opportunity. Uh, and this is back in like 2009 ish when there was only a couple of people ma- really managing fighters. And before all the Malkies of the world and all the, I think there was like Black House, which, um, you know, Ed Soares, who managed, uh, um, Anderson Silva and a couple people was out there, but there was really not a lot of big management companies. And I thought that, you know, that this could really be an opportunity. So some of the people that I had trained with, worked with and known um, guys like Carl Parisian, uh, Dean Thomas, um, a bunch of UFC vets, uh, guys like Lyle Beerbaum, uh, Andrew Fickett, um, and then a bunch of up and comers. We started managing just the MMA people and that quickly turned into like also producing some events and putting them on cards and getting them into bigger events and stuff. And then that segued into some other aspects of, um, uh, of extreme sports. Like we had um, Elise Post who's a, a BMX silver medalist. Um, William Truebridge is like one of the top free divers in the world, a few other Olympic athletes and stuff. The problem is that it's, it's outside of sponsorships. It's hard to monetize those people because they don't really make um you know, any money from these events, so, you know, like, and if they do, it's in the, in the grand spectrum of things, I don't feel comfortable um, commissioning something that we didn't do anything for, right? Like they're going to make 10 grand to go to an event. We did nothing. We can't get, get a better contract because they're just favored nations. And, you know, like it's, what's the purpose of that? So, so that kind of hit a wall after several years. And um, I, I, I finally got to a point where I really got into cryptocurrency and some real estate stuff and decided, Hey, you know what? what if I gave the acting stuff a try again and I wanted to have a little more control over it. So, and this is just kind of segueing into this, this, the most recent thing I did is I had uh, a good friend of mine, Tom Malloy, who's got, she's produced over, you know, 18, 19, 20 movies. He literally wrote the book uh, on independent film financing that's on Amazon. It's uh, I don't, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but you know, he, he's raised a bunch of money. He's raised over, you know, $30 million for independent films and owns a distribution company now and writes scripts. And then a good friend of mine, Charlie Shrem, who Charlie owned the first Bitcoin exchange bit instant back in um, 2011, 2012 in New York. It has a very interesting story. And Charlie's yeah, wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. He's a, he's a super OG. Charlie's wife was a, is an aspiring actress. So I kind of had the, the, epiphany like wow what if i put charlie together with tom and they could find a script that his wife liked and charlie can finance it and and uh, the script happened to be this movie ask me to dance that has um uh just recently been shot in new york in may and should probably be released early next year it's a it's a feel-good holiday movie about misconnections and it's a it's a funny little low budget comedy that i do think it'll find an audience it has joyce dewitt from three's company um it's uh, Brianna. Are, are we going to see you dance in it? Uh, dear God. Well, you know what? I, I say no, but yeah, at the <laughs> end, there's like a group dancing that's very like. Gotcha. Um, it's very, yeah, it's very goofy. Uh, group Different dance. choreography than, than, than when you were fighting, I'm sure. Uh. Yeah, it's, yeah, luckily it was, it was easier. Most of my fights weren't choreographed, thank God. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. I got to ask you, you know, and, and this is kind of uh, off topic and, and circling back a little bit, but, um, I, what was the the worst food that you ate traveling through human weapon um you know shooting those episodes or was it when you were a, a contestant on fear factor because i know you guessed uh, you were a contestant on fear factor ages ago what was the worst thing you had to eat was it the fear factor food or the human weapon food well you know that's that's i guess if you use uh, there's a broad definition of what would be food i guess if you're looking at if you ever look at fear factor i guess if you say anything you put in your mouth and swallow is considered food then then fear factor we had those giant horse grasshoppers and um oh man that was your cheese. episode the grasshoppers yeah, it was yeah but it was back when fear factor was doing four stunt episodes and um the like one of them was non-elimination and you'd win a car or some crazy crap um that was pretty crappy but you know overall the, the challenge that I ran into is that I would always try to eat like low carb food, even through my like Atkins and stuff. And just when I was, when I was fighting and when you're in Southeast Asia, 
first of all, most of the countries there, they don't have like their, their chickens, cows, they're not pumped full of hormones like ours are. So a chicken here is two and a half times as big as a chicken there. But when you're in these remote areas, like you're, you know, you're in the mountains in, um, you know, Japan or you're way, you're, you're, you know, you're four miles into the jungle of Malaysia. It's hard to get like you know good food. So you've got these. <laughs> Here's, here's your two cups of rice and some bento boxes. So like I was constantly eating just like shit. I just was always like, Oh God, I just feel like a, a fat piece of crap constantly eating stuff like that. So most of the food was, was okay. I did realize that Northern China, when we did the, um, the, uh, Oh gosh, okay. What was the episode? It was, uh, I can't think of the episode, but Northern China has some of the worst food I've ever eaten in my life. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. And that's, that's probably the, the worst part of it. Um, and obviously Greece, France, Israel, pff, amazing. Europe food is, is fantastic. When we were in the U S obviously that's a no brainer, but um, yeah, it was Northern China. Uh, stay away from it or, or bring your own food is my, my. No, for sure. I, I, that, that, I'll, I'll note that for my future travels and make sure that, uh, yeah. that I bring, bring some stuff for the road. If I head over into Northern China, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when you when you get uh when you were a contestant on Fear Factor was that the the first time you had met um Joe Rogan was that like before you had known him as a friend? Yeah, that was the first time I met him, and then I I didn't um uh, I didn't run into him again for several years after that. I maybe I don't know, maybe not several, but at least three or four years later, uh, I when I had finally moved to Los Angeles to do jujitsu and just haphazardly I went to go train at John Jock Machado's, and I was like, hey, I just want to do no gi because I haven't worn a gi since I started fighting in 1998. And they're like, oh, you should go to Eddie Bravo's. And I went to Eddie Bravo's and Eddie Bravo and, and Joe Rogan have been best friends for years. And yeah. uh, vicarious, nice. yeah, exactly. And vicariously, I went up to the the comedy store on on um, Sunset and saw Joe perform. And it's a really small room. I mean, the rooms hold 60, 70 people. It's not a big spot. Mm-hmm. And afterwards, he's always just hanging out in the back. And I was like, hey, you know, and he, he totally, Joe has a memory like a freaking elephant. Like he remembered me, remembered my story, remembered my name. And, and I was like, oh, I'm training at Eddie's. He's like, oh, dude, I'm, I train at Eddie's all the time, you know. And he started up there and we just built, built a, a relationship from that. And then he knew that I was fighting and, you know, used to uh, hook me up with UFC tickets and, you know, take me out and let me ride coattails a little bit, which was, uh, which was fun. Yeah, he's he's done all right. He uh he has a, a podcast too, um, from what I hear, a pretty decent one. Um, does oh all my right. god, yeah, done done all right. How crazy! I remember, you know, like having the behind the scenes of that. I remember Brian Redman and uh, you know, like Joey Diaz, Eddie Bravo, myself, and Brian Redman used to kind of be the a little bit of the group. Ari Schiffer was in there too. Um, mm-hmm. and uh, the first time. You know, Joe had done Joe before he was doing the podcast was doing video blog like uh, uh, blogs for his website where he'd have Brian Redman always like videotaping everything he did and he was, was like really before YouTube was even really prevalent and he would just upload all these video blogs to his JoeRogan.net site and right. um, and then from that he's like you know what he bought a couple microphones and had Redman do this this podcasting and I forget the platform it was even on this is like the one of the first <laughs> podcast platforms like way back in the day and I remember watching it. And just being like, wow, this is, this had, I mean, it had no focus. It had no, it was just basically Joe at Red Ben. He sent a microphone, I think to Joey Diaz with some headsets. And I think he gave Eddie Bravo one and they were just like, all just getting high and just, just talking, just like, oh, let's, yeah. just, let's just talk. And they had some shitty <laughs> graphics that had snow on them and stuff. And it was just like, I remember watching it and just being like, well, this is going to go nowhere, you know, <laughs> so, you know, but that's one of the things like I've, I, man, I've just, Joe has always been an inspiration because I think so many people go through life chasing, like from the time we're born, right. That we're like, what we're, what's drilled into our heads. You got to go to school. You got to get good grades that you can get into a good college. You can amass a bunch of debt so you can go to a grad school so you can get a really good job. And then you can work your way up to that corporate ladder and you can make X number of dollars and that's happiness. But Joe has, um, you know, ever since Joe has followed passion first and his money's come later. Like he, he loved, uh, you know, stand up and always does stand up. He loved the UFC fights. I mean, he, he was commentating, not even commenting. He was doing like backstage interviews for the UFC for free for a while, you know, before yeah. his manager was like, um, they have money. They need to start paying you. <laughs> he, and uh, the same thing as podcasts. Like he didn't do it. Now people, I mean, Joe's probably inspired 95% of the podcasts that are out there now to see, you know, just how big and how lucrative podcasting can get i mean i think his spotify deal was 110 or 100 and something yeah. something obnoxious million dollars um and what's great is i don't think that joe feels like he works 
a day in his life. And of course, I'm, I'm speaking out of turn a little bit, but um, just from my interactions and knowing Joey, you know, I think that's that's awesome. I mean, one of his stand up things he used to talk about when he was doing Fear Factor was he's like, you know, well, uh, they keep paying me. I'll keep showing up. And he's like getting these idiots to do dumb shit. And I'm just like, that's funny, you know, like because that's just Joe being Joe. And I think that's one of the most endearing things about it is that, you know, he's Joe's just a very Joe's a very transparent person. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's having conversations with people that interest him and and friends of his and things like that, taping them and getting paid for it. And I think the allure of his podcasts and podcasts in general is that it's not I mean, some of them are are mass produced by whatever, you know, uh, conglomerate uh, podcast uh, network. Right. But but many podcasts are kind of untethered. They can do what they want, say what they want. They're not controlled by any outside interest. Right. And. Um, right now, when you turn on the television, if you're watching, it doesn't matter if it's CNN or Fox News or whatever, there are driving forces behind the content that you're seeing, um, no matter what channel you, you flip to. Right. Whereas with podcasts, like a lot of times you can get kind of, uh, I don't know, like like an unfiltered access to to what people are really thinking and what people are really um, putting out there, um, which I think is kind of cool. Um, I want to share with the listeners before before I, I let you go that um that you were extremely uh cool to me really good to me when i saw you four years ago um my my wife and i had our first year anniversary and the week after we were heading to like st john st Kitts in the in the virgin islands and i didn't have a place to watch the mayweather mcgregor fight i really really wanted to watch it and uh, you and your wife were, were very kind to host us as we were passing through miami um you know uh, out of towners and and not really having a place um, so I just want to say thanks uh, for that. And um, is there anything you want to promote? A- ask me to dance. When, when are we going to see that? Um, I, you know, that's a great question. That's really up to the distribu- uh, the distrib- uh, distribution company in terms of kind of where that falls. So um, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that'll probably be Netflix beginning of next year. But um, I will uh, definitely pump out that information as I get it. Sounds good. Where can people find you on social media? So um, it was a big week for me last week. I felt like on my Instagram verified that little blue check mark meant the world. <laughs> so, nice. Very nice. Yeah, yeah right. Um, you're, a, you're a real boy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now I can get like free Kit Kats or something. I don't know how that works. So, uh, so um, yeah. So on on Instagram, I'm probably the most active on there, and that's uh, the uh, Instagram at the Jason Chambers. Um, yeah, I'm on there pretty pretty frequently uh, with posting stories. I'm still trying to figure all that out because, you know, I'm 41 years old. And, like, for me, Twitter was, like, the first real social media platform I was on disseminating information. And I still go on Twitter. But now it's, like, you know, I have a 21-year-old son and, like, everyone's on TikTok. And it's, it's so hard. It becomes a full-time job trying to keep up with these social media platforms. Yeah. Yeah. No, and there's a new one every minute. And then some of them fall off, like, MySpace and whatnot. But um looks like instagram's here to stay so so on instagram you're the jason chambers yes yes the jason right. Chambers. pretty sure that's it <laughs> sounds good follow him on instagram and look out for the release of ask me to dance jason i really appreciate you uh taking the time to speak with us today i thought this was a, a great conversation and you're welcome back on anytime you want uh to promote anything cool man appreciate it thank you all right have a good one you too And that'll do it for another episode of the Know It Some podcast. My thanks again to our guest this week, the always entertaining Jason Chambers, for sharing his time and his stories with us. Really enjoyed that and hope to have him on again sometime. Folks, if you haven't done so already, please head on over to your favorite social media platform and type in Know It Some Pod. We are Know It Some Pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. We are there on social media at Know It Some Pod. And I appreciate all of those who have written into knowitsomepod at gmail.com with their feedback. Really appreciate that. I do try to read and respond to each and every message that comes in. And that said, I really appreciate it if you go to Apple or iTunes and hit that five-star ranking for us so we can continue to bring you these incredibly interesting guests week in and week out. Uh, All the support has been overwhelming, and I am truly honored to have hosted for the last 16 episodes and hopefully remain your host for the entirety of the show. Folks, it is is outrageous how much uh, this thing has blown up. Um, completely and totally took me by surprise uh, the support and the amount of listeners that this podcast has gotten in such a short period of time. Please tell a friend. Please continue to grow this because 
we have some great stuff in store for you over the next few months, and that is due to your support. So thank you again, and I'll see you next week.